Brian Patrick Miller is standing trial for the murders of Angela Brasso and Melanie Burnus in Phoenix, Arizona, committed in 1992 and 1993. DNA from the crime scenes has been used to identify their killer by his last name. Everybody. Welcome to the True Crime Squad. I'm Christy Brower, here with my sister, co-host, and partner in crime, Katie Weaver. Hey, Katie. Hello. How's it going? Well, she's <laughs> back. <laughs> yeah. So many I... people are so glad to see your smiling face. Oh, gosh. It has been a long road. I've had COVID for eight days at this Ugh. point. And... I sound worse than I feel. I actually feel really so, so much better. But uh, still the, with the dry, hacky cough, you know. But I finally yeah. went, you know what? I better just come back because I don't know how long this voice and this cough is going to go on. So <laughs> I better just go to work. <laughs> but well, I'm glad to be back. I'm glad I'm feeling good enough to be back here. Yeah, so, yeah it's me too. Been a long road, you guys. If you haven't had your booster, by God, go get it. Do not put yourself through this. Yeah, no kidding. No kidding. It's not worth it. Oh. At all. Oh. No. I, I feel like I've lost a week, honestly, in a lot of ways. Oh, yeah. Well, you have, really. I mean, I've been very lucky. My daughter, Matea, came home uh, and helped take care of me for several days. And, of course, Scott uh, has also been sick, but he's not been nearly as sick as me and never did test positive for COVID. But uh, he's... You know, between Scott and Matea, they've taken excellent care of me. And, of course, all of my little doggy nurses have been amazing. Right. So <laughs> I basically can't do anything without three chihuahuas on top of me at all moments. So I would bet they're very concerned. Yep. Very good medicine. Yeah. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah. Well, good. Well. And thank you for holding down the fort. Absolutely. You just did the same thing for me through surgery and vacation. So... <laughs> I know. We need some normalcy, for God's sake. Right. I know. I'm like, we just got to get back to our normal routine. Jeez. Right. <laughs> That's it's, it's happening right now. This is the beginning. That's right. This is the beginning. Yep. Yes. All right. Well, uh, I think you're going to kick us off with some Florida man. Oh, God, am I? <laughs> oh, Florida man. Or should I say Florida men? Mm. Yeah. Oh boy. This rotten tub of sour cream times two <laughs> are the two worst dads you can think of. Oh no. And I'm going to tell you why. Their names are Frank Allison and William Hale. Well, Frank and William live in Florida. Mm -hmm. And Frank and William were both driving down the road. And they're both idiots and hotheads and got in a road rage, in road rage incident. Oh. So they were driving back on, on a highway and doing things like passing each other and just and slamming on the brakes and stuff like that. Just doing some really aggressive stuff in the car. And one of the female passengers of one of the cars flipped off the other car and that really started things off. And there was just this brawl going back and forth on the road. They were both driving at high rates of speed, being really irresponsible. They Thanks. both had their families in their cars. Not this was smart. like one unbelievable dumbass meets another. Yeah. So finally, one of them has had enough and pulls out a gun and shoots into the other person's car and then takes off. Well, when he did that, he shot a five-year-old little girl in the leg. Oh no. So her dad doing what any good dad would do, just went straight to the hospital with her. No, he didn't. No, he this is Florida did. man. <laughs> Florida man. 
Oh, no. He ran this guy down and unloaded his gun into his car, striking his 14-year-old daughter in the shoulder and went into her lung and uh, collapsed her lung. Oh, my God. So now they have both shot each other's children and have bleeding children in the car. So at this point, they both go straight to the hospital. No, they don't. Uh, yeah, I was going to say. They do not do that. They get pulled over. Because, you know, <laughs> shooting on the highway. Yeah. Before the police can deal with them, they both leap out of their cars and start fighting. Beating <laughs> the shit out of each other right in front of the cops. Because they're out of bullets at this point? Yeah. Jeez. With injured, with, with shot children in their cars. God. Ugh. The police managed to separate these fools and, you know, get medical services there for their children. Luckily, both girls uh, are going to be fine, um, except for that these are their fathers. So, I mean, that's never going to be fine. Uh, yeah. But, uh, and these two, of course, were both charged with a, a litany of things. But I just, I... <laughs> Your kid gets shot and you just keep going? Yeah. What? You just keep fighting? What the hell? Yeah. Not genius level stuff here. No. I'm Not talking at all. about a couple of real stable geniuses in this situation. Mm, God. So I hope that both girls, you know, are okay and can be okay. And I hope uh, that these two both go to prison for this. Right. right. I don't know that they will, but they should. I mean, they shot children. Yeah. God. They both did. Yeah. Idiots. Insane. Yep. So there you go. Florida man. Well, that was a Florida man to top all Florida men. <laughs> Are you right? Thanks. Well, I'm going to kick the mic back over to you for our main case. Yes. <laughs> We share a lot of DNA for the win cases on this show and, you know, have been doing a lot of learning about genealogical DNA and the things that can be done to identify uh, killers. But boy, this one is a new, this is a new one for me. This is Brian Patrick Miller. Brian Patrick Miller is on trial right now. His trial just started on October 3rd. And he is on trial for the murders of 22-year-old Angela Brasso, who was killed in November of 1992 in Phoenix, Arizona, and 17-year-old Melanie Burness, who was killed in September of 1993 in Phoenix. Wow. They were both, they both disappeared while riding their bikes along the Arizona Canal in North Phoenix. Um, Brasso's body was found nude and decapitated in a field near a bike path by the canal um, a while, not long after she had gone missing. And then 10 months later, uh, Bernice's body was found floating in the canal. So there was DNA evidence collected at the time of these crimes, but they had not um, really gotten anywhere beyond that. These cases went cold, unfortunately. And back in the early 90s, DNA technology was definitely not um, up to what it is now. So... Miller was arrested in 2015 after um, some really interesting and tricky DNA stuff went along, went on. He denied um, any involvement, although he did acknowledge that he did live there at the time and he did ride his bike on the paths in the area where both women were killed. So about nine months ago, Miller was found mentally fit to go to trial. So he did try 
a an, an ins, ins, insanity plea um, to try to get off for this. And he was evaluated by two different uh, um, psychological evaluators who both found that he is, in fact, um, fit to stand trial. One of them also indicated that they felt like he might actually be malingering, that he may be actually faking some things. So his trial started last week on October 3rd. But let me tell you how they found him, because this is this is next level DNA stuff. OK, so. A forensic genealogist. Uh, was working on this case. And that we don't know a lot about everything that happened because a lot of it they're they're hanging on to because he's on trial right now but um there was a a forensic genealogist was able to lead police to him and actually tell him tell them the police his last name so there is this method that doesn't have a lot of precedent. This is pretty new stuff um, that uses a particular genetic marker that comes from the father's side of a person that can be used to track like family lineage based on, you know, the common practice of a woman taking her husband's name when they get married. Of course, it doesn't work if you didn't do that, but um, it, uh, it can work. So police had, you know, had this DNA for all this time, but, you know, it, it had been run through CODIS and, you know, run through their um, databases and stuff several times. Um, but there was never a, a match like this person's um, DNA had never gone through the system, which you're going to hear is really unfortunate because it actually should have been in the system even before these murders were committed. But what they, what she did, as far as we know, is that she submitted his DNA through an anonymous account to one or two different, probably one particular genealogy website that uses a, a marker on the Y chromosome. And in using that, tracked that person's genealogy down and uh, told the police that she was quite sure that they were looking for a man with the last name of Miller. I just find that's that, amazing. Isn't that mind blowing? Yeah, it is. Um, so we don't know exactly how she did it, but she used something called YSTR, which stands for short tandem repeats. It's something called a genetic stutter that is passed on from father to son. So, and that gene is unaltered. So when it's passed down, it doesn't change. Uh -huh. So um, somebody in his family had submitted their DNA to either family tree or um, ancestry, but they really think it's family tree because apparently family tree is the only one that identifies that paternal chromosome. So they identified this guy, you know, he lived in the area at the time. He lived along the canal. His last name was Miller. It turns out, you guys, that he had already committed a couple of other crimes. He stabbed a woman when he was 16 or 17. Um, he went to prison briefly was released at 18 and eventually exonerated. Um, and then was charged with a, another assault on a woman, was also exonerated for that one. Both of these occurred prior to the murders. And it's just really unfortunate because if either of those charges had stuck, his DNA would have already been in the system. Because if you go to prison, your DNA is in the system. Right. That's how it works. Now, yeah. 
But even back then, he didn't actually go to prison. He went to a juvenile um, a juvenile facility, and then he didn't go to prison for the other one. Okay. So just very strange. So apparently, Brian Miller is well known in this community where he's been living, because he's back living in Phoenix. Can mm -hmm. you imagine murdering people in a city and then continuing to live there he had moved and lived in other cities for a while and then come back to phoenix but can you imagine coming back to live there after you have committed some murders there you'd think there would be some self-preservation around that <laughs> but there really isn't any um but he was well known in his community people called him zombie hunter because of a zombie hunter uh bumper sticker and he's known to drive an old police car that still has the lights on top of it. So he's pretty, uh, pretty visible in his community already. And the way this works with DNA is that you can't just use the genealogical stuff. You have to prove it. Um, oh, sorry. Katie's coughing real hard and knocked herself off the uh, stream. <laughs> so she's gonna she'll be back in a minute so um police tracked him down and he was in a coffee shop drinking a cup of coffee and when he left and left the coffee cup they took the coffee cup and tested it and it matched the dna that they had from the original crime scenes now they've already been in court trying to throw the dna out saying that his right to privacy was violated the thing that we know and that has been around forever already is that he you give up your right to privacy if you leave something in public if you throw it away you know it's clear that your intent is to abandon it and he had got up and left and left the coffee shop and left that cup there so pretty obvious that he was not um you know expecting any privacy for that particular item. So that's what they used then to identify him. Um, there've been a lot of delays in his case um, because of the, the fight over the DNA, which of course did get, you know, allowed to stay in. And then um, the, his competency and COVID because he was actually originally arrested in 2015. So we're just barely now seeing him go to court. Court started last week. And the families in this case are finally starting to have a say and, you know, see some justice for their family members. Uh, also, his, his um, DNA is being used to look for other crimes because they just don't really believe that these are the only two murders he's committed. It's hard and, to imagine that they would be. Right? Especially because he's committed some assaults prior to mm -hmm. this well i mean he was exonerated of them but i mean looking at this now it's pretty unlikely that it wasn't right him. well why stop right yeah and he did move around to some other places and so you know it'll take a little time to do some looking but they may find other other uh victims as well but i just find this uh this dna of being able to actually identify somebody's surname you know, and of course it would be birth name uh, through DNA, though, is fascinating. It it'll it gets disrupted because not everybody keeps, you know, not everybody is keeping their surname. You know, not all women are taking their, their husband's surname and, you know, yeah. not all kids are getting hyphenated. You know, there's different stuff happening now, sure. but for a long time. That was very much the traditional thing to do. Yeah. And uh, it's just one more tool in the toolbox to be finding and convicting or at least identifying uh, murder murders that happened way back a long time ago. You know, 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s. I mean, we've seen some really old cases getting solved through DNA. But to literally be able to say pretty sure this guy's last name is going to be Miller is whoa super super amazing okay. it's amazing I mean we've said it before but I'll say it again anyone who has committed crimes in the 
80s and 90s particularly, even 70s, you ought to be terrified right now yeah. because DNA is coming for you. It is. It is. We're just seeing it over and over and over again that these old cases that have gone cold are suddenly hot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as, as this gets better, as we have get more of these genealogical DNA experts that can do this kind of work, and as we find a way to get the DNA work to be a little cheaper, well, uh, it's going to get even better and better. The way it's being funded right now. So, you know, in some of the states is crowdfunding, yes. you know, and wealthy people that are like, yeah, I'll pay for a thousand tests or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. it's people want to see these cases cleared. They want to yes. see them closed. They're willing well, to pay. And the fact that we have the capability and it's not happening everywhere is bullshit. It, it makes me really mad that we're, we're, we're giving our police military level weapons and tactical gear and stuff. And yet we're not using um, our full capacity of DNA to identify and, and put away people who are unsafe in our communities. I mean, this guy committed these murders in the early nineties. They are going to find more crimes. There is no way that he just suddenly stopped. He didn't. So long that wasn't as, even in the beginning of his spree, sure. I don't think. But so long as the detectives in whatever cases, wherever, did good forensics. I mean, and that's that's the key. Yeah, I mean, we've seen cases, DNA cases that have been solved from like the 60s. Yeah. When they, there was no such thing as DNA sequencing or anything even thought of. Right. And yet some of these detectives did an unbelievable job of saving DNA. Yeah. yeah. Knowing that the capabilities to for identification were coming and were going to be mm -hmm. better. We've seen some tremendous stuff. But this is a totally new one and a pretty unproven one. But this case is blowing that wide open because she was absolutely right. Her analysis was completely right. And they proved it. And now he's on trial. You know, like we're going to we're going to start seeing this paternal line thing happen more. So yep, without a doubt, amazing. I found that amazing. So that case is uh, going through the court system right now. We'll let you know how it goes. Um, you know, they are going for first degree murder and the death penalty cool. in, in both cases for him in Arizona. And so we shall see what happens there. But oh, also it's a bench trial. Um, I suspect that he didn't want to face a jury with the terrible things that he did to these young women, did horrible things to their bodies. And the fact that he's been free all this time, 30 years free, uh, you know, I, I th and then the DNA, I just think He's not going to get any sympathy out of a jury. That's for sure. So, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, really looking forward to see how this plays out and how it may also come into play in cases going forward. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Well, that's what I've got. I hear you have a crime update. I do. All righty. Well, I don't know if you knew this, but October is Sex Offender Palooza Month in the courts. Uh, what? <laughs> no, I did not. Harvey Weinstein. Oh, right. And then, of course, Danny Masterson mm -hmm. and Kevin Spacey are all on trial this month. Ah, uh -huh. well, it is. Let's get rid of these jackasses. Yep. But today we're just talking about this already starting to decay, Ugh. but not quite dead yet, guy. Uh, Harvey yeah. Weinstein. My God. Yeah. Look at this prick. Ugh. Can you even? When you can start seeing the evil seeping out from the inside, you know something's real bad. Right. So he is currently in Los Angeles on trial. He's already been convicted and been working on a sentence in New York. Mm -hmm. of 23 years but now he's uh in uh looking i think at 11 uh charges 
in Los Angeles. Well, he is pulling quite the Glenn Maxwell, and it's really making me laugh. Oh, is he? So I just had to share a couple of things that his uh, lawyer bitched about today to the judge. Apparently, he's being held in a courthouse holding cell for three or four hours after trial before being taken back to the jail. And it's almost medieval conditions. Oh, my God. You mean he can't just call an Uber? <laughs> no. The jail Uber is really slow. <laughs> Unsanitary, fetid conditions. That's what he said. He even told the judge that he doesn't even have access to a bathroom. And the judge point blank called him out for being a liar mm -hmm. and said, I'm not going to let the record show that there's no bathroom because we both know there's a bathroom. Well, I, it's not clean enough to use. Uh, hi, this is jail. Mm -hmm. And we don't care, Harvey. No, we don't because you're an asshole who has been a predator for your entire adult life. His Fuck off with said, all that. Right. His attorney said he's very worried about him surviving this ordeal without a heart attack or a stroke. Sucks to suck. The judge said, I'm just not sure there's a lot to be done about that. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the problem is he's in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And they only have so many wheelchair accessible vans. So he has to wait uh -huh. there in a holding cell for a while before a van can come get him. That right. can take him back to the jail. And apparently it's just not nice enough, guys. Well, you know, you fuck around and you find out. I, I have no sympathy for this. So, Harvey, I hope you're having the day you deserve. Yes. I hope you slip in that uh, fetid medieval uh, <laughs> hell pit and, you know, fall in a pile of your own shit. That's what I hope. <laughs> oh, me too. Me too. That sounds That's... perfect. Like and a daily hope... experience. And then I hope that your attorney uh, really complains to the judge about it in open court so that we can hear that because yeah. I, this is entertaining the hell out of me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We'll take it. Yeah. Yes, we will. <laughs> so have fun, Harvey. Have the day you deserve. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for that. That was a way to bring a little lightheartedness <laughs> to the end of this episode. <laughs> Because none of us give a goddamn about Harvey Weinstein, that's for sure. <laughs> no, well, we do not. This is our Wednesday episode. We will be back tonight with case updates at 7 p.m. Mountain. We're doing um, a live stream on YouTube and Facebook. And we've got all kinds of stuff to talk about. Even though we've done quite a bit of case updating just in our regular episodes this week, there's still a lot going on so excited to share including Jalissa Fuentes being found yeah including Jalissa Fuentes. sad yeah. outcome there but we'll tell you all about it tonight yeah some good news for Adnan Syed yes some bad news for Billy Shamir Mir, who definitely <laughs> deserves a lot of bad news yeah it's you just wait it's a lot it's a lot you too have the day you deserve Billy yes. Shamir Mir. yes definitely <laughs> But, all right. Well, thank you for being here with us. Don't forget to like, subscribe, share, and comment. It helps us grow. We really appreciate it. And check us out over on Patreon. Just go to patreon.com and look for True Crime Squad. You will find us there. If you join our Patreon, you get access to the Psychic Hour. And you also get access to literal years of extra episodes that we have been doing only for patrons you may ask us for a case and you don't even know but we've already done it and it's over there so check that out and uh you know it we are the true crime squad thanks for being here take care